So if you can be turning your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to pick up um, at the point we left off with uh, last week, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, and we'll start in, in verse 1. Uh, we're going to be looking today at, um, at, at, at the, the symbol, if you would, of Melchizedek. The author has introduced him a couple of times previously. We saw back in chapter 5 and verse 10, where he first introduced this idea of um, Jesus being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And then he said, but there are some deeper things about that that are difficult to explain because they become dull of hearing. So there was a digression into uh, talking about what they're being dull of hearing and what the danger would be from that. But ultimately, he spoke about how he was confident that they, uh, that there were better things in store for them. Uh, and then at the end of chapter 6, he returns back to this idea that Jesus uh, has become a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And that's actually a quote from Psalm 110. And we'll talk just a little bit about Psalm 110 in our lesson tonight, uh, but we'll get more into that um, in next week's lesson and, and looking beyond that point. But now what he's going to do is take these first 10 verses here of chapter 7, and he's going to talk about the story of Melchizedek itself and then make some spiritual applications um, as it applies to Jesus in the, uh, in the lessons that follow. So we're just going to look uh, this evening at the story of Melchizedek and make some, uh, make some application of the symbols that we find in that story uh, that will help us to understand better uh, the role of Jesus as our high priest. Now, that's the subject that the author of Hebrews introduced back in chapter 2, uh, in verse 17, that Jesus was to become our faithful uh, high priest. So the story starts here in chapter 1, verse 7, uh, describing how that uh, this Melchizedek, who was a uh, king of Salem, and let me see if we get slides advanced here, that he was the king of Salem and a priest of Most High God. Now, Immediately, what we see here is a connection, a connection made between both being a priest and also as a king. And we're going to talk more about that in the middle part of our lesson this evening. But I just want you to see that here, that he's described by the author as both the king and the priest of Most High God. Now, in the story, we find where this is Abraham had gone um, with his servants to go fight against some kings that had come and had uh, conquered uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and two other or three other uh, allied cities and had taken captives, including uh, Abraham's nephew Lot. And of course, that's the, the main motivation that Abraham has to, to go and rescue them is to rescue his, ne uh, his nephew. And so as they are returning back from the battle, the king of Sodom has come out to meet Abraham, which we read about in Genesis 14 uh, and in verse 17. But we also see that um, as the king of Sodom was coming to meet Abraham, that also this Melchizedek, uh, who is described here as the king of Salem uh, and a priest of the most high God, he comes and he meets Abraham. And the story tells us that Abraham gave a tithe of the spoils of the battle to Melchizedek. While well, at the same time, Melchizedek has brought um, bread and wine, and he blesses Abraham. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 14. Even the blessing that he gave Abraham is very similar to the, the promises that God had made to Abraham back in chapter 12. Uh, now, what's interesting about that story is the fact that Abraham gave one-tenth of everything that they had recovered uh, from these kings. He gave a tenth of that to Melchizedek. Then, in the story where the king of Sodom offers to let Abraham keep all the rest of it, Abraham refuses to do so. Uh, and instead, he says, no, I'm not going to keep any of it, lest it be said of me that, that the king of Sodom has made me wealthy. Now, part of that story, of course, relates to what we know about the, the region of Sodom. Uh, back when uh, Lot had settled there, it says that the people were exceedingly wicked. And so Abraham did not want to receive any sort of blessing or any sort of uh, 
spoil from the king of Sodom, and yet from Melchizedek, the king of Salem, he does receive a blessing from him, and in fact gives a tenth of all of the spoil to Melchizedek. Now that's the basic story uh, found in Genesis chapter 14, but what the author wants us to do is to learn some things from that story. Uh, here we have the, at the end of there in chapter 14 where it says that he would not take anything uh, you know, from the king of Sodom so that the king of Sodom would not essentially say, I made Abraham rich. Now, in verse 2 of chapter 7 there in Hebrews, the author starts to make the points. He tells us, first of all, that we have the translation of his name. Uh, Melchizedek comes from a combination of two Hebrew words, melech, means righteousness, and Sedek means, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Melech means king, and Sedek uh, means righteousness. So literally his name translated means the king of righteousness. So this name, Melchizedek, means the king of righteousness. And then he is described as being the king of Salem. Now, uh, experts are telling us we really don't know whether Salem is Jerusalem, uh, the first record we have of that actually comes from the time of Josephus and also the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there's a reference to this idea of Salem being the city of Jerusalem, a, a, an older name that the city had, but that really is not made clear in Scripture and that uh, we just simply don't know whether that's true or not. But the word Salem itself means peace. It's the roots of uh, the term shalom, which we're familiar with in, in more modern vernacular, is just simply a, uh, a change in the word over the centuries, but it literally means peace. And so the writer of Hebrews is telling us there is significance both in the name and the title of Melchizedek. He is the king of righteousness, and he is the king of peace. We're going to come back to, to what that thought means for us. But then also he's described as a priest of most high God. And that's actually literally taken from Genesis 14, which emphasizes the fact that Melchizedek was a priest of most high God. Now, this is to emphasize that uh, he's not a, uh, a priest of the Canaanite gods. Uh, if you remember, God had made this promise to Abraham telling him that when the sin of the Amorites in the land in which he lived was complete, then his people would come and possess the land. But the writer of, of Genesis is making clear that Melchizedek is not one of those people. Uh, he's not one of these people who is uh, digressing away from God and serving other gods. He is a priest of the Most High God. And so for that reason, Abraham has come and he gives this tithe uh, to this king. And so we find there, this is where they had come there. What's also significant is what we find in verse 3. The writer of Hebrews makes an argument here from silence. He says, there is no lineage. There is no father or mother. There is no beginning. There is no end. But Melchizedek simply shows up on the historical record, the inspired historical record. He simply shows up. And he never ends. And the writer of Hebrews is telling us that that is significant. Uh, the fact that God does not record a story of where Melchizedek came from, nor does God record for us a story of where he went or how he ended. Then that is significant to God's people. That is significant for us to recognize of Melchizedek essentially remaining a king and a high priest forever. Now, as we go through the remainder of chapter 7, the author is going to emphasize that point as it connects to Jesus. But first of all, we need to see what it means about Melchizedek. Now, don't get you wrong. The, the author is not saying that Melchizedek just suddenly appeared out of nowhere. He's not saying that there is anything miraculous about how he came on the scene. It's not any sign of a miraculous birth. It's not saying that Melchizedek is still alive somewhere, hiding out in some cave or doddering about like an old man. Melchizedek, the person, was born in the normal way that people are born. He did die. But those things are not recorded in the record. 
because what we want, what the writer wants us to understand is he became a priest by the declaration of God. And no one ever supplanted him. No one ever took his place. And so for that reason, he is a priest perpetually. And that's the argument that the author is going to make, is that he remains this priest perpetually because there's no beginning, there's no end. He simply is a priest because God has declared him to be a priest. Now, that's essentially the story of Melchizedek. What we want to do from that point is to understand what does that mean to us. And I told you last week that, that you know, bring your steak knives because we're going to be looking into the meat of the word. And that's what I think the author is trying to get us to understand. One of the questions that I asked you last week was to consider the number of people that we read about in the Bible that are both a king and a priest. I'm going to pause at this moment and, and just kind of ask some folks if you've got some an answer to that, if you've got some passages for us to look at, to suggest who do you find in the Bible that was a priest and a king? Uh, so let's just go ahead and just pause at that point if somebody has uh, an answer to that question. Does anybody know who were, who is both priest and king? How many people that we read about in the Bible? I must have answered the asked the impossible question there. One of them we're looking at, and that's Melchizedek. Uh, he's described as both a king and priest. See somebody popping up on chat here. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Someone sent me a chat message to say Jesus, and that's most certainly true. Uh, he is uh, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There is one other. And uh, I ask if you can also. Uh, go ahead. Us. Oh, very good Very good answer there, Dan. Um, I'm are, not saying that we're necessarily under this same order, but we are considered priests and I, I didn't do my study on this one, I'll be honest with you, Eddie, but I know that uh, we are priests. Yes, absolutely. We are pre we're not high priests, but we are priests. Right. And we're told that we will reign with Christ. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thought. There is one in particular by name that we can look at, and we will look at here in, in just a little bit. Um, but there's a man in the Bible by the name of Joshua. Not the Joshua we normally think of, but this is a Joshua who was uh, a high priest, actually the son of the high priest, who is also has a crown placed on his head. And we're going to talk about that story in just a moment. What I want us to understand significant about that is how few there are that are described as being both king and high priest. In fact, what we find as we go through the Old Testament is this idea of being both king and priest is something that was kept very separate from one another. When we go back to the law of Moses, there were two basic lines of authority. There was the civil authority that, of course, was in the embodied within the king. And there was the spiritual authority that was embodied within the high priest. Now, when you first see the law of Moses, of course, they did not have kings, but yet we understand that God had still recognized that there would be a king. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, the beginning of verse 14, Moses is telling the people of Israel, even before they come into the, uh, into the land of Canaan, he gives them instructions. He says, now, when you decide that you want to have a king over you, these are the things the king must do. And particularly the idea was that he was to make a copy of the law, and he was to read it daily. And then there was also some do nots. He was not to go back to Egypt. He was not to get horses. He was not to multiply for himself wives, and he was not to multiply for himself wealth. And it's interesting when we look at the story of Solomon, Solomon did all of those things that he was not supposed to do. Uh, or on the other hand, his father David, we're told, did 
anticipate, was excited about both the mornings and the evenings when he could devote himself to the word of God. So the priest had the responsibility of teaching the people, reading the word of God to the people. But the king had a unique responsibility in that he was to have a copy of the law that he was supposed to read himself. He was supposed to read that every day himself. So you've got these two lines of authority from God, and yet they were always kept separate from one another. In fact, let's go to the very first king. Saul, of course, was chosen as the first king of Israel. What was the very first sin that we find recorded about King Saul? Well, we find that in 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning of verse 8, that it was one of the wars with the Philistines. And it says that the people of Israel had gathered at McMash and, and the Philistines had gathered their army. And the Philistines were had a massive advantage in number of people. The Philistines had uh, weapons of iron, where the people of Israel only had their farm implements. And it even describes how that there were no blacksmiths in, in Israel because they did not have the ability to work iron like the Philistines did. So the Philistines had every advantage in this impending battle. And we're told that, in fact, the people of Israel recognized this. They were hiding in caves, and they were deserting the army. And for seven days, Saul is there with his army. Every day he sees that more and more of his soldiers have deserted because of fear. And Saul finally decides that because Samuel hasn't come yet and the people are getting ready to just completely abandon him, he says, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And so he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he had finished, it was still the seventh day, the day Samuel said he would come, Samuel did come as he had promised. And Samuel came to Saul and said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and you did not come within the days appointed, although he did because he was talking to him within the days appointed, that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. And I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and I offered the burnt offering. So God's appointed king took upon himself the role of the priest. And what does Samuel tell him? You've done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So God made a very clear distinction between the authority of the king and the authority of the high priest. And when Saul mixed those two, God took the kingdom away from him. He said, your kingdom will not be established. He said, if you had remembered your place and had done what I told you to do, then your kingdom would have been forever. But now it will not be. God will find a man after his own heart. God will find a king who understands what his place is, understands what his authority is, and the authority that God gave to the high priest. There's another example we find in the book of uh, in the book of Second Chronicles in chapter 26, Isaiah. Isaiah was one of the good kings of Israel. We read about him in verses three through five. It says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Here we find the king and the high priest, Zechariah, working together according to God's plan, each of them in their role, each of them with their line of authority. And when they did so, they prospered. But then as we go further into Second Chronicles, a man who served for 50-some-odd uh, years as king of Israel said when he grew strong, he grew proud to his destruction. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. He entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah, the priest, went in after him. This is the priest who came after Zechariah with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor, and they withstood King Isaiah. They said to him, 
It is not for you, as I, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Isaiah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And the story goes on to tell us that he remained a leper for the rest of his life. His son had to, to rule his co-regent with him, uh, because Isaiah could no longer sit on the throne. He could no longer be in the presence of the people as king because he had tried to take the role of the priest. So there was a very clear distinction that God made between the high priest and the king. And the two exceptions is Melchizedek, who we're talking about now. But notice Melchizedek precedes the law of Moses. He comes many hundred of years before the law of Moses. And Joshua, who I mentioned before, Zechariah chapter six. Part, you know, partly because of our lack of, of depth of study of the minor prophets, we often don't remember a story like this. But it's so significant, so important, understanding the role of the Messiah. We find there, beginning in verse nine, the word of the Lord came to me: Take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedidiah who have arrived from Babylon, go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold, make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now notice here, we have this branch. Of course, the book of Isaiah talks about the branch, and that, of course, is the Messiah, the son of David. He will branch out from his place. He will build the temple of the Lord. What was it that Jesus promised? Destroy this temple in three days, I will build it back up. He will bear the royal honor. He will sit on the throne. So he is king, but it says there also will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, what we find prophetically there, the symbol of the idea of both the king and the priest sitting on the throne is in fact united in the person of the Messiah. What do we find here at the end of Zechariah? It says, those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So this crown, sitting on the son of the high priest, was a symbol for the people of Israel in the time of Zechariah that God is going to unite bring together the royal lineage and the high priestly lineage, bring them together in one person. And that one person will be both a priest and a high king. And what that does is it unites these two lines of authority together in one. I want to pause at that moment and ask you to put your thinking caps on here. Think about two questions we're going to ask you. First of all, under the Old Testament, of course, you have a theocracy. It is a government that is based on the rule of God. The Greek term theos means God, and, and the kratos is the rule. So it's the rule of God. That was what we find uh, of the people of Israel. It was a theocracy. Today, of course, in our country, in our culture, we live in a democratic republic. Democracy means rule of the people instead of rule of God. From the viewpoint of God, in which one of those conditions does God have more authority or less authority or the same authority? In other words, from the, from the viewpoint of God, is his authority for under over the people of Israel, is it more or less or the same than it is for God's people living in the United States? 
I think Dempsey has made it very clear in his studies that he's been doing on Wednesday evening. It remains the same. God is sovereign over all. And the government of men doesn't change that one iota. Uh, what was it that Jesus said to Pilate when Pilate had asked him, said, don't you know that I have the, uh, I have the authority to take your life or I have the authority to grant your life? And Jesus had told him, says, you would not have that if it had not been given to you by God. Making it clear that God's authority is supreme and absolute from his viewpoint. It is supreme and absolute, and it does not change regardless of the governments and authorities of men. But now I want to ask you the question, what about from the viewpoint of God's people? Was the authority of God over the people of Israel more or less or the same than the authority of God over us today? They lived under a theocracy, a, a, a God rule government. We live under a, a, a democratic republic, a a rule essentially of men, is God's, from our viewpoint, is God's authority more or less or the same today? And I believe what the writer of Hebrews is arguing, it is more today. And that's what I think we see with this idea of the kingship and the high priest being united together in one. Because what we're going to see is that both as a king and as a high priest, Jesus is greater than what the people of Israel had. Jesus is greater than, in fact, what any of God's people have ever had until Jesus came and fulfilled this role. United these two authorities together in one. And in doing so, from our viewpoint, from the people of God's viewpoint, his supremacy is greater than what any God's people had ever known before. Uh, I think that this is the, the point that the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to understand. Not just us, obviously, the people of his day. Remember what they were facing. They were living under the Roman government. They were facing persecution from the Jews who had uh, the civil authority and the quote-unquote religious authority in Israel and in many other places where the Jews exerted uh, their influence. The, the Romans, of course, had the essentially universal civil authority within the, the Roman Empire. Uh, because of that, they were facing persecutions from all different viewpoints. It would be challenging for them to recognize that there's, in fact, a greater authority that there's one who stands above all of this. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to establish. He's trying to establish in their hearts and in their minds that Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is the one who has all authority, both as priest and king. If you look in the book of Philippians, uh, in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse uh, Verse, uh, verse 20 is very familiar to us. For our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we array the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to get the context of what Paul is talking about here. We go back to verse 18. Paul here is talking about those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. He's writing to the church in Philippi, and he's telling them about some of the things that have occurred that causes him to write this letter to them. And he says, for many... The many there are brothers and sisters. For many saints for, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and the glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. That's the key there. Paul says they've become distracted by, they have set their mind on the earthly things. And in that context, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power, notice here, that enables him to subject all things to himself. So when Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, what he's contrasting there 
is those who are distracted by the things of this world, the earthly things. And he's trying to bring their attention back to the idea that our citizenship is in heaven because Jesus rules from heaven. And he has the power to subject all things, all people, to himself. That's the, that's the point that Paul wants the Philippians to understand. And that, I think, is what is central in understanding this idea of Melchizedek being both the king and high priest, and Jesus being designated a high priest according to that order. The author of Hebrews is wanting us to understand what does that mean, combining both the idea of king and high priest. Uh, I'm going to pause at this moment if uh, anybody's got questions or comments or um, have I just completely got you scratching your head? And what in the world is he talking about? Anybody I think any? you raise. I think you raise a good point about us being under a greater uh, authority. You know, the earthly kings and the earthly priests. You had an earthly representative, and you had an earthly mediator. Now that we have a heavenly one of both of those things, how much more so does that, you know, fall on us to fall under that authority and and to treat that office with the respect that it deserves, uh, and more specifically, the owner of that office with the respect that he deserves. And I think that's I think you're right. I think that's what the Hebrew writer is trying to get across. Uh, thank you, Adam. And I, I think you probably said that clearer than I did. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that. Uh, anybody else with any uh, any thoughts or comments? And there's no need for elections. There's no need for the war with sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is the king of peace now, and he is taking his place on his throne forever. And what yep. great confidence we have in that. I mean, it's um, something I forget almost every day and take it for granted that, that we don't have to worry about about that anymore. We don't have to worry about another king taking over or, you know, we have to worry about what we can control, of course, but but Jesus is king. He's not going anywhere. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. That's, that's so true. We get distracted by these things of this world. That's why Philippians 3 means so much to us. Our citizenship is in heaven. Keep your focus uh, on our king and our high priest. Anybody else with thoughts? I think, you know, the fact that Jesus is not only high priest, but also king is the icing on the cake. But even just looking at the priesthood, the Hebrew writer, I think, is making the point that the priesthood that Jesus represents is greater than the Levitical priesthood. That You guys thought the Levitical priesthood or even the Aaronic priesthood was the end all be all. But there was a priesthood greater than that and you know that it was greater than that because it goes back farther and even Abraham it was it was a priesthood that was greater than Abraham and Abraham's greater than Levi so you know and those are really your two choices here I think the audience here the danger of them was that they would go back to Judaism or that they would try to merge Judaism and Christianity into one religion uh, and the Hebrew writer is making it very clear that if you go back to the priesthood of Levi you're taking a step down uh, from the priesthood of Christ. Yes, I agree. I appreciate those thoughts. Anybody else with anything? Well, Dan Galloway mentioned something there that um, I think it really sums up all of this idea. Remember, we talked about the, the, the translation of the name. And that's the point the Hebrew writer is getting us to recognize. When we fully submit, completely submit in our lives to our king, again, what does his name mean? King of righteousness and king of peace. So when we submit to the king of righteousness and the king of peace, what effect is that going to have in our lives? We will be righteous people and we will be people of peace. So regardless of the wars that go on around us, whether it be physical wars, whether it be spiritual wars, whether you know, whatever conflict is existing, we can be people of peace. We are people of peace. 
What was it that Jesus said? Come unto me, who you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. And indeed, that's what we have today as we submit fully and completely to our king. So when we talk about this idea of Melchizedek, mentioned only twice in the in the New Test or in the Old Testament, uh, understand how significant that story is. All right, let's move into the, the last section of what we're going to cover in our class this evening. And that is the, the point that Mike just touched on. The idea that Melchizedek is greater than Levi. And, and the author is going to emphasize that point. Uh, I, I use the term Melchizedek in, in the title of the lesson today, uh, the great Melchizedek, uh, because the author emphasizes that point. Observe how great this man was, uh, to whom Abraham the patriarch uh, gave this, uh, gave the tithe, uh, gave a tenth of the choice of game. As I mentioned, it's only mentioned briefly in two Old Testament passages. We've got five verses in Genesis 14. We've got, um, I think, four verses in Psalm 110 uh, that talk about Melchizedek. Some total of everything that, that we find about him from the Old Testament. And yet the author of Hebrews is going to make a very powerful argument based just simply in those two brief passages to show that Melchizedek is in fact greater than Levi or Aaron and all of the priests who come after Aaron. First of all, the first argument he makes is the fact that Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. And in doing so, Abraham submits himself to Melchizedek. He is submitting himself as recognizing Melchizedek is greater than he. That's why the author says this great man. He wasn't talking about Abraham. He was talking about Melchizedek. As I mentioned, you know, when God had made these promises to Abraham and told him that he was going to possess all the land of Canaan, and he specifically emphasized the sin of the Canaanites, Melchizedek stood out as different from that. And apparently Abraham was very aware of this. And so when Melchizedek comes to meet him, in contrast to the king of Sodom, Abraham shows great honor and submission to the king of Salem and gives him a tenth of all the spoil, whereas he essentially rejects what the king of Sodom is offering. So the first argument is the fact that because Abraham was giving the tithe to Melchizedek, he was submitting himself. To Melchizedek. The second point that he makes is found in verse 5. He says, Indeed, the sons of Levi who received the priest offering had commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. So now we find the sons of Levi who are descended from Abraham collecting tithes from the people of Israel who are also descendants of Abraham. So although they are equals in the sense that they are both sons of Abraham, we still find where the sons of Levi are the greater in the sense that they're receiving the tithe from the remainder of the people of Israel. The high priest, the priest in general, had a role of uh, superiority, if you would, or a role of authority over the people of Israel. That's what the role of the priest were, was to collect this tithe, they were the ones who were to be the teachers of the law, but they were to be respected and honored by the people because of that role. But now notice the contrast he makes in verse 6. But the one who is not traced from Abraham, his genealogy does not come from Abraham. He's not one of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Israel. He's one outside of Israel. Remember the people said, we are sons of Abraham. Well, Melchizedek was not the son of Abraham. And yet the author of Hebrews makes this argument, makes this point, yet Abraham regarded him as greater. He received the tithe that Abraham offered to him, and in doing so, Abraham is saying, essentially, that he is greater than I. Now that's a very powerful argument to a Jew. To have Abraham, their father, declare about someone else, he is greater than I. That's an extremely important point, extremely powerful argument to be made. And not only that, but in verse 6, the last part of verse 6, it says, 
and he blessed the one who had the promises. Now, Abraham had already received the promises from God, promises that were still very important to the people of Israel. And yet we find that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. What significance does that make? The writer of Hebrews says there is no dispute. Nobody disagrees with the idea that the greater always blesses the lesser. So when Melchizedek blessed Abraham, we find him accepting this role of being greater than Abraham. So both from the viewpoint of Abraham who offers the tithe and the viewpoint of Melchizedek who offers the blessing to Abraham, we find both of these men in agreement that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. So what does that mean? Well, notice what the author says in verse 8. He says, in this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them who is written that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, also paid tithes. So what we find here is essentially two arguments that are connected together. One is the fact that the sons of Levi were mortal. That's what he's saying here in verse 8. Mortal men receive tithes. Aaron and all of his descendants, every single one of the high priests, Josephus tells us there were 83 of them, all of them received tithes, but all of them were mortal. They all died. But he says the one who lives on. Melchizedek, by the record, does not die. His priesthood did not end in death. And so he's the one who lives on, and he collected tithes from Abraham. So therefore, that means that Levi, the sons of Levi, the priest, they received tithes, but they also paid tithes to one who was great. Now, he describes here as being in the loins of Abraham. That's actually a common term that was used in the Old Testament. In Genesis 25, remember when Rebecca uh, felt the children struggling within her when she was pregnant with the twins, and she inquired of God, why is this so? Why is this constant battle going on within my womb? And God's response to her was, two nations are in your womb. Was it literally two nations that were in her womb? No, it was two, two boys, Jacob and Esau. But symbolically, through Jacob and Esau, we find Israel and Edom. And the wars that continued between Israel and Edom is being symbolically fought out within the womb of Rebekah and these two unborn children that were fighting within the womb. In Genesis 35, we find where uh, God makes this promise, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you. Kings shall come from your own body. Again, not literally kings, you know, multiple kings being born, but it's the idea that the symbol of that which was in them is their descendants that come after them. Even in the book of Malachi, uh, going back to Jacob and Esau, we find where God, speaking prophetically through Malachi, said, I have loved you, as he's speaking to Israel. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Paul in Romans 9 is going to uh, expound upon that idea. Even before they were born, God had made that determination. I have laid waste his hill country, left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom the Lord is angry for it. And in fact, the warfare between Israel and Edom continued all the way up through the New Testament. We read about, of course, Herod. Uh, Dipsy talked about this, how that Herod was, in fact, an Edomite who had, uh, his people had literally been forced by the Israelites to accept the law of Moses against their will. And, and Herod had become essentially the king of the Jews, but he wasn't even a Jew. He was actually an Edomite um, that had accepted Judaism because his ancestors had been forced to accept. And so this warfare continued on. Uh, 
between Israel and Edom up until the time of Christ. But this idea of being within the loins is this very common Old Testament reference. So Levi is represented within the actions of Abraham. So when Abraham offers tithes to Melchizedek, Levi is offering tithes to Melchizedek. The high priest who all descended from Aaron are offering tithes to Melchizedek. They are recognizing him as the great one. And so uh, Mike's point is absolutely right. What we find here is that Melchizedek, who precedes uh, Aaron and all the descendants who came after him, is in fact declared by God to be great because of the actions of both Abraham and Melchizedek in offering the tithe and in turn giving the blessing. Does anybody have any comments or questions then about what we have studied today um, in these first 10 verses of the book of Hebrews? Anybody with any thoughts? Anything that uh, that I've just left you in complete confusion, or um, anything that 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 you know jumps out at you? Eddie, yes. Uh, in verse eight, it says, "In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives on." The person who lives on there is Melchizedek, although we all were not saying that he never died, but right. he lives on in, in the fact that his death is never recorded. Is that the point you're making? Yes. Not only that his death is not recorded, but really even more so that the end of his priesthood is not recorded. Uh, Aaron, we had the specific reference of when he died, and when he died, they had a ceremony, and his son Eleazar became priest in his place. When Eleazar died, Phineas, uh, his son, became priest in his place. So there was this continual lineage of when one high priest died, you know, it, it would continue on to the next one in, in the lineage. But we don't have that with Melchizedek. So essentially what we have is an argument from silence. We're going to see another argument from silence in what we study next week. Uh, but the writer of Hebrews is a very good logician. He uses valid, powerful, logical arguments uh, to make the point ultimately about Jesus. But yes, I think that's exactly the point. His, his priesthood never ended. Okay, thank you. All right. Anybody else with um, uh, thoughts or questions or comments? Eddie, I have a question. This is sure. Linda. Um, it seems that Melchizedek is a means of introducing the idea of a higher priesthood, which is Jesus, who is coming. Um, could this be a device for that purpose, that it's preparing people to break away from the Levitical priesthood and think about the idea of a higher priest? I, I think you're exactly spot on. That, that, that in a nutshell, is, is exactly what we're looking at. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I noticed, you know, just Googling Melchizedek that apparently he does show up in a couple of other writings. So even though he's only mentioned a couple of times in the Bible, this is not somebody that the Jews had forgotten about. So I think it certainly could have been met as a, as a lesson to them because they, they clearly were still thinking about this guy and maybe wondering uh, what the deal with him was. And now, now they finally found out. I appreciate you uh, looking at that. I I'm assuming it's some of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, yeah, there was there was apparently at least one Dead Sea Scroll that mentions him, and uh, it looked like there was one other uh, re uh, fragmentary reference to him. They're kind of fanciful. I wouldn't want to get any scripture out of them, uh, but uh, it still just shows that they were thinking about this guy and that they had not forgotten about him. Yes, yeah. I, I appreciate those thoughts. And certainly because of Psalm 110, uh, you know, he had to he had to be significant. Uh, let me make one further point about Psalm 110. If you if you turn your Bibles over there, I don't have it on the screen, but look real quickly over at Psalm 110. Uh, it's maybe the most significant at least size of all of the uh, Messianic psalms. Uh, 
Psalm 110, I think, is only seven verses long. But I want you to notice two things about it that are really significant as we talk about it in our lesson this evening. Verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. So what we find there is this idea of ruling as a king. The scepter, of course, represents this. Having the footstool is the king putting his feet on his enemies, uh, you know, coming from Zion. So here we find a reference to the Lord being king. This is the question, of course, that Jesus had, had asked of the Jews. How did David say in the spirit, the Lord said to my Lord uh, about his son? You know, how, how could the son of David be the Lord, uh, the Lord of David? And of course, the, the people could not answer them. And, and so from that point on, they didn't dare ask any more questions because the, they couldn't answer his own question. But then in verse four, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So what do we find in this psalm? We find the combination of both the idea of ruling as king and serving as high priest. And so even in this prophetic messianic psalm, you find this image, this veiled image, if you would, that talks, talks about how the Messiah will be both king and priest. Um, and so I, I, I fully understand what Mike is talking about. The Jews would have been thinking about that because as we looked at the other references, they saw what happened when a king tried to be priest. It didn't go well. Anybody else with thoughts or, or comments or questions about what we talked about today? Yeah, hey, this is Brian. Yes. Uh, fun fact about the son of Jehoshadak that mm -hmm. you referred to in Zechariah, his name was Joshua. He was both king and priest, and his name was Joshua. And Joshua is the Hebrew form of the name that comes to us through Latin is Jesus. And Thank you. Je Jesus' name was, uh, they, they wouldn't have called him Jesus in his day. They would have called him Yeshua mm -hmm. or Joshua. Yes. So I, th I think that is not a coincidence that, uh, that the son of Jehozadak was named Joshua. I, I appreciate you bringing that out, Brian. I actually had that in my notes and I had just uh, skipped past it. And I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Uh, that again, just further emphasizes the, the point that we're looking at. It, it's, it's fascinating to me how that we can look at all of these things from the other side of the cross and from the other side of the inspiration of writers like this and, and see what God had, you know, clearly hidden under our noses. And, and you know, there's just so many things that emphasize that point. That's one of the things that's so amazing to me about about Melchizedek here is you read the Old Testament, you know, you can read through the book of Genesis and you see like about two or three verses where Melchizedek is mentioned and then he's mentioned once in the Psalm and and you would think, well, this how could this be such an important person and what a you know, how could we make any important point out of this? But then all of this argument in the book of Hebrews comes from Melchizedek and who he was, and it tells us so little about him, but that, that so little that's told about him is so important. And right. it, it makes me wonder about so many other people in the Old Testament who are mentioned just very briefly, and I'm wondering how much am I missing because I haven't studied carefully and thought carefully about them the way I need to. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very valid point. And what that ought to be is a challenge to us um, to dig deep and, and to find those hidden nuggets of, of wisdom and uh, examples that God has, has put there before us. And, you know, it's just hiding because we don't dig deep enough. I appreciate those thoughts, Brian. Uh, somebody sent me a private note and a, a very valuable one. Uh, Psalm 76, uh, verses 1 and 2, talks about God uh, being known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. His tabernacle 
is in Salem. Not Jerusalem, but Salem. Now, obviously, in that connection, it does seem like Salem and Jerusalem um, are connected together. So I appreciate uh, the one who sent me that note. Well, uh, I, I really appreciate the thoughts and, and um, hopefully this will continue to stimulate us to, to keep on thinking. Let me look very quickly at the at some of the questions. Actually, these are the ones I gave you last week, but these are the ones that will continue on with what we're gonna be studying next week, the remainder of chapter seven. Uh, what is so important about the tribe from which Jesus is born? And there's really two answers to that question. Um, how is Jesus qualified? In other words, how did he become? What quality did he have to have to become our high priest? What was the process by which uh, he became high priest? And then to me, this is very significant. From the viewpoint of the author of Hebrews, which one is better, having many or having one? Uh, and, and I think that's a significant point in, in understanding this idea of Jesus as our faithful high priest. Well, if there's nobody else who um, has any thoughts or comments, we will uh, end at that point. Um, Brian, if you are still there, would you mind uh, unmuting yourself and, and leading a prayer for us, please? Yeah, I can do that. All right, thank you. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing us with, with uh, living in a time and an age when we can use this technology to meet together and study a word together, even though we may be uh, physically far apart. We ask to help us to use the, these blessings of our age to glorify you and to uh, share the gospel with others around us. Uh, we ask that you be with us as we, as we dismiss from this class this evening. And uh, if it be your will, may we be able to be back together again soon to study your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.